Hey there, Niels. Uh, I didn't watch all three videos yet. I just watched the first one, but I wanted to make a preliminary response now so that um, I can address an issue uh, specifically. Um, I'm going to make a distinction between two types of systems. There are allopoetic systems, which we may also call mechanical systems, non-living systems, and then there are autopoetic systems, self-creating systems, organisms. Um, now the difference is an allopoetic system, which could be, um, for instance, this remote control. It has a structure and an internal organization. When I push a button, I give it an input, and the output is not only that light, but the information sent to the television. Um, an autopoetic system, on the other hand, such as myself, creates its own structure. This has to be built by an external agent. You know, a plastic shell is not alive, it doesn't grow itself. My body grows itself, so part of the organization of my system is to produce its own structure, whereas the organization of this remote control does not produce its own structure. It produces inputs after receiving, or it produces outputs after receiving inputs. Now, I think I see where you're going with this notion that um, there is no free will because all systems behave according to the inputs they receive. Um, and so if I receive the input from the stoplight, which is red, the output is my foot pushing down the brake and slowing the car down until I come to a stop. When it turns green, that is the input, which cues my organism to step on the gas. Um, and we can certainly describe it that way, and we will have been meaningful, but I think we must um, make some further distinctions here. Autopoetic systems, organisms, are not determined by their environment. Um, the theorist responsible for coming up for autopoesis, um, Francisco Varela and Humberto Maturana, were trying to come up with a way of uh, not only describing what life does, um, you know, most biologists don't define life. They say, well, a living organism is something that has metabolism and that reproduces itself. Um, Matrana and Varela wanted to get to the essence of life and, and really figure out what it is. What is the essential quality that separates an organic system from a non-organic system, an autopoetic system from an allopoetic system. And one of the distinguishing factors is the notion of operational closure, which means my body doesn't receive inputs from the environment, which it then um, processes and computes an output, because the structure of my body determines the way that those inputs will be processed. In other words, when the red light is processed by my eyes, it becomes a red light because of the structure of my eyes and my, my nervous system. It is not a red light existing objectively out there in the world which sends information of red lightness directly into my brain where it is pictured again and processed. In a sense, the structure of my nervous system constitutes the light. So the input is not a function of this deterministic environment out there. It's a function of my own internal structure. And I hope I'm being clear enough that this makes sense. Um, so in other words, because I have this internal structure, which is responsible for my ability to perceive a world at all, um, it is not as though I am a machine which requires an external agent to push buttons or apply inputs uh, which are processed and spit out as outputs. Um, 
another uh, implication of this notion of autopoiesis is that um, the defining characteristic of life is not reproduction. Because if we go back to before life emerged on the planet and we have this soup of, of chemistry in the ocean, say, the first bootstrap where chemicals created their own boundary or, you know, an, or an early type of uh, cell membrane probably would have been considered alive, but it, the first instances of this bootstrapping where chemicals will create a membrane and then have their own internal operations going on inside that membrane that is now separated from the environment in, in a very important way. Not totally, because it's so influenced, but it is now, it, it almost forms its own virtual domain. It's an emergent property. And so we may have had many instances of this type of emergent self-enclosed chemical reaction occur, but they, it could not reproduce itself. Um, and if we extrapolate this and say, say I'm sterile and I cannot have children, I'm still alive, right? So then these early forms of, of proto-life, we may say, if we assume that um, the defining characteristic of life is that it can reproduce itself, they were still alive in some very important sense. So from the perspective of the autopoetic theory, the essential characteristic of life is not reproduction because just as I do not need to be able to reproduce to be considered alive, a self-enclosed, self-creating, autopoetic system, an organism does not need to reproduce to be considered alive. So now the essential characteristic of life becomes autopoiesis, or self-creation, instead of reproduction. Um, and as I was saying before, the notion that my own um, operational closure prevents me from interacting with my environment as though there were inputs, which would, would be my sensory, um, this, the data which is received by my senses, and the outputs being my behavior. Um, when we look at it that way, it does seem as though the environment is what pressures my organism and causes evolution. But if we look a little bit closer, the mutations which take place in the genetic code which cause the evolutionary process to, to occur, along with behavioral mutations which also influence evolution, they occur because of my own internal structure. And so long as my own internal structures, genetic mutations or behavioral adaptations are not um, detrimental to my survival, the environment will allow it. So in other words, in, this, in a very important sense, there is a co-evolution going on, um, being driven both from inside out and outside in. Now, if my organism, my own structural, structural closure decides you know, metaphorically speaking, decides to um, adapt in a new way, and the environment uh, doesn't allow that adaptation to be an adaptation. In other words, it doesn't allow that to um, um, allow for my further um, development and, and life on the planet. In other words, if I evolve that my a new adaptation such that my mouth seals up. Well, I can't eat, so I'm going to be naturally selected out of existence. But to a certain extent, there's there's an amount of freedom offered by the organism to um, decide its own evolutionary path. And so long as that evolutionary path doesn't contradict the environment's restraints upon what will allow the organism to survive, then the organism can proceed. Now, what this doesn't say is that the organism is therefore free. This notion of free will versus determinism is another issue entirely, and I personally do not even think that it is um, a, a valid framework to break this up into. 
but um, we'll have to talk about that in another video. If I didn't make sense uh, trying to describe these issues, let me know and I'll try to um, clarify. They are very abstract concepts and I have trouble explaining them and understanding them myself. So um, yeah, let me know what you think.